Welcome everybody to our second YouTube lecture. As you see, this one is called European Exploration and England on the Eve of Empire. So dramatic. All right, so this is a continuation of the, sec uh, of the first one. Hopefully you've already watched the first one. Although as of now, there's only about 20 views. And I believe there's over 200 students in my classes. You can do the math yourself. See that that's not very good, but we'll see how this goes along. All right, so we're going to start off by talking about factors of European exploration and what led Europeans to actually finally leave Europe and to go to what we will call the New World. And we're going to do this in those three categories that we've already established, starting with social, trade. Trade, trade, trade is always so very important for society to succeed. Um, if you remember, it was the Crusades that got... Europeans, their first contact with the Middle East, and thereby also not just the goods and the services of what was being produced in the Muslim world, but by extension also much of the luxuries of Asia, predominantly China, uh, porcelain and ivory and uh, other spices, spices of the Middle East. These things become extremely important to the Europeans. Now, if you also remember from the first slide, there was one particular European group of people who basically dominated this trade, uh, the Italians. In fact, the Italians became very wealthy at that, and that's what eventually starts the Renaissance. So other European powers are now growing, and they're wanting their own piece of the pie, as it were, and they'd like to figure out ways to um, cut out the Italians, you know, not have to go through Italian trade in order to get to the spices and other luxuries of life that they would really like to have. Uh, what The first real group of Europeans who are going to do this are going to be the Portuguese. The Portuguese will start to explore the coast of Africa. They'll become on friendlier terms with Muslim countries in North Africa and eventually start to sail around. By 1420, uh, a man by name who's known as Prince Henry, sometimes called Prince Henry the Navigator, will establish a school uh, for navigation, trying to encourage other individuals to go out and explore. And that's exactly what eventually will happen. Uh, due to improvements in maritime technology, which we've talked about as well in the other slide with the astrolabe, but also... Something else that was very important, uh, triangular shaped sails are now being invented and multiple sails for a ship, allowing them to catch more wind and to travel faster and farther than ever before. So by 1488, you'll have Bartholomew Diaz will sail around the Cape of Good Hope, the southern tip of Africa. And by 1898, Vasco da Gama will actually finally establish uh, Portuguese trade with India. But it's also important to note that at this time period as well, the Portuguese are going to begin trade in something that Europeans had never been involved in. By the 1440s, they'll get involved in human trade, trade of African slaves. Now, the trade slave in Africa is something that was already well established for centuries. Uh, the Europeans are not the ones who came down there and you know, introduced us to Africa. Africa was already trading in slaves. Uh, the Portuguese simply got involved. They found this as also a way of, of making, well, money. Uh, it, it's a very lucrative trade for them. But as, this is a theme, obviously, in American history that we're going to talk a lot about. And it's going to lead to a lot of social issues even to this very day in this country. Political. Uh, the rise of nation states. Um, this is very, very important. As we said, Portugal has now emerged as a nation state, and it would like its to control its own destiny, control its own economy. So they're going to want to find 
their own trade routes. France is starting to emerge now as well as a nation state. Uh, we're going to talk in a few moments. Spain will emerge by 1492 as a nation state and also England is emerging. So these are also very strong factors that lead Europeans to exploration. Uh, overpopulation, I skipped over that, and social, this is also obviously very important. They're running out of land in Europe. People are going to have to go somewhere, and many of them will eventually leave and go to the New World. Economic issues. Feudalism. This was the economic system of the day. Large lands owned by these lords divided up to their vassals, and their vassals controlled, we'll, we'll say, the peasants on their land. This was a way of collecting money, but it was also a way of creating a political and military power as well for the lords who eventually became kings. But as, as we said, with overpopulation, land is running out. So they're going to have to do something else. And this is going to lead from exploration to eventually colonization. But I have down here something called the Price Revolution. This is actually a backlash, a, a negative uh, situation that happens due to colonization. When the Spanish and the Portuguese especially start to come to South America, uh, they start to find large quantities of gold and silver. This leads to this large influx of silver and gold coins throughout Europe, uh, driving prices of goods up while wages stay the same or in a lot of situations actually drop, causing large inflation. Also, two other factors, population, as we just mentioned, and urbanization will also lead to the price revolution. This is going to actually cause more people to have to leave Europe and to go to America to try to find a way to economically improve their station in life, which leads to this new economic system known as mercantilism. This is something we're going to talk a lot about in class, especially in the early part of American history. You see there are three factors to mercantilism, a favorable balance of trade, a gold supply, and colonies. Well, as these nation states are rising, they realize how important, again, trade is. It's a social issue. It's a political issue. It's an economic issue. How can you control trade? Well, through exploration and colonization. You find land in the new world, and you colonize it. You send individuals from your country there. They go, they find all the raw materials that you need, lumber, gold, other precious metals. And as we'll come to find out in America, uh, uh, animal pelts, especially beaver, become very important, as well as food becomes a huge commodity. Corn, wheat, and eventually also something, well, something we're obviously familiar with called tobacco. All these things are very important, and they'll be uh, either grown or cultivated or excavated in the colonies, sent back to the mother country to turn into a good and then sold back to the colonies. This created the favorable balance of trade for the mother colony, and it was good for them. It was good for France. It was good for Spain. It becomes very good for England. Not so much so for the colonists. And that's something, again, we're going to talk a lot about throughout our course here in the first few weeks, it's going to lead to the American Revolution. That's why it's so important. Now, let me ask you a question. Who do you think this particular person is I'm about to show you? I know some of you are wondering if it's a man or if it's a woman. Sometimes we look at these paintings during this time period. We can never tell. This is... Christopher Columbus. Uh, oh. oh, I'm sorry about that. Well, I guess it is true. We have to think about Christopher in two ways. In one way, he is a great hero to some people of Europe, but he's not considered that to many other Native Americans. Obviously, it's, it's with his voyages that begins the, the, the beginning of the end, we would say, for Native civilization. So a lot of people do not like Christopher Columbus. I'm going to talk a lot about him here. We're going to do a little bit in class and talk more about him there. But again, trade, very, very important. Christopher Columbus knows this. Uh, he knows that the Portuguese are sailing around Africa. The Italians are controlling the Mediterranean. Many other men, not just Christopher, but there are many individuals who begin to, to theorize that if you sailed straight west into the Atlantic, you would just naturally reach Asia. 
He believes that the earth is probably much smaller than what we know it to be today. And he believes he's found a direct route. Now he begins to go to various governments trying to get someone to agree to finance a voyage. Of course, the Portuguese flat out tell him no. They already have their own exploration taking place. But Spain, again, we mentioned earlier the rise of nation states. 1492. Two things happen here. Early 1492, you have King Ferdinand of Aragon marries Queen Isabel of Castile, uniting the two powerful houses of Spain. This is very important because Spain, for the last 400 years, has been at war with Muslims, the African Moors, the African Muslims, in what they call the Reconquesta, the reconquering of Spain. For 400 years, they've struggled with this. When these two houses finally unite, uniting their armies, they eventually, by August of 1492, will be, actually before August, I should say, before August, uh, they will capture Grenada, which is the last stronghold of the Muslims in Spain, thereby ending Muslim rule in Spain. Christopher Columbus takes advantage of this. Here's a brand new nation. They're going to need their own economic viability. They're going to establish themselves in the world. Christopher Columbus comes with this crazy plan of sailing out in the Atlantic Ocean. And it's a win-win situation for the Spanish. I mean, if he succeeds, all the better for Spain. If he loses and he, you never heard of again, well, we tried. Big deal. No loss here. So they do finance his voyage in 1492. And that's August. August of 1492. He sets out 36 days it took him to reach land. Uh, and one near mutiny that his individuals didn't quite like being out in the ocean that long, his, his fellow uh, his seamen who went with them. Of course, he doesn't land in the America, in America. He lands somewhere in the Caribbean, perhaps the Bahamas. And at this point, he comes in contact with a group of people known as Taino, Taino Indians, who are part of a larger group of Indians known as Arawak. And that's where things go really bad eventually. And again, the second day of school, we're going to do a whole lesson on Christopher Columbus and the Taino. And this is really the point that leads the Spanish from exploration to colonization. They're going to want to colonize the Caribbean, and then eventually they'll discover the mainland of South America, Central America, and also North America. We're going to go to another individual here. This is Queen Elizabeth I, the daughter of Henry VIII. Now, the English were latecomers to exploration because there's a lot of turmoil going on in England. Uh, again, in the first slide, I talked to you about the Protestant Reformation when Martin Luther broke away from the Catholic Church in 1517. Henry VIII, in his time period, he was against the Protestant Reformation. He was a Catholic. England was a Catholic nation. But then Henry wanted a divorce. He, he, he had a child with his wife, Catherine of Aragon, but, he, but it was a daughter. He wanted a son. When his wife could not produce a son or any more children, he wanted a divorce. Actually, he wanted an annulment to claim that the marriage never happened. And yet he's got a little child there, and he's trying to claim the marriage didn't happen. Well, of course, the Pope isn't going to go for this. And Henry gets all, you know, full of himself. I'm Henry VIII. Da, 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 don't you know who I am? And he breaks away and decides to become a Protestant. And he forms the Church of England, known as the Anglican Church, making himself the head of state and the head of religion, of church. And he kicks the Catholic Church out of England. Of course, they don't go without a fight. That's going to cause a lot of turmoil and suffering. And it's really not until his daughter finally becomes Queen of England. She will begin to settle things down socially, religiously. She also stabilized the government. Uh, she'll be able to take on the Spanish. At one point, the Spain tries to invade the Spanish Armada in 1588, and that becomes a failure. And England starts now on a rise as a political power and a political player in the world. And this is going to lead England on its road to exploration. So that brings us to England on the eve of empire. Some of the things that were going on here, and this is our last slide that you need to know. Uh, again, socially. Well, remember we talked about the price revolution. The price revolution hurt the nobility terribly so in England. They had these large landed estates. They were living in feudalism. 
And basically, they started to rent out at fixed rates for long term. And as prices began to just triple all over Europe, this really hurt them financially. But it helped two other classes, the gentry. These are men who are also large landowners, but they're not part of the nobility. They just, oh, for whatever reason, their families were able to acquire large areas of land. And they decided to rent out their land on short-term leases. They also became very involved in business. Many of them will uh, become merchants and own very lucrative businesses and become very, very wealthy, much more so than much of the nobility. And then the yeoman class. These are individuals who are small farmers. They maybe have two, three, four, five acres at best. But during this time period, as a family, they cultivate their land and make money off of what they're able to do, not really being affected by the price revolution at all. So as this group of people start to grow, they start to gain more and more power in England. Also, like we said, religious toleration issues between Catholics and Anglicans basically start to come uh, to a moment of peaceful uh, resolve under Queen Elizabeth, which leads to political changes. There's this institution in England known as Parliament. It's like our Congress. It's a two-house situation. And think about it. The nobility are part of what's known as the House of Lords. As they became hurt by the price revolution, their power in Parliament began to decline. The gentry class, they were elected men to the House of Commons. Their power began to grow and grow and grow. So now a shift is starting to happen in England. They get these series of laws known as enclosure laws passed. They want to protect their lands. So they don't want peasants anymore living on the land. Literally, they want to enclose the land with, with fencing and kick the peasants off. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people now homeless and roaming England. They're going to raise sheep here. The wool industry was one of the biggest textile industries in Europe. But obviously now with kicking peasants off, you're going to create high unemployment rates in the wool industry. See, they were in what's called a domestic system where they had people raise sheep for them and shear the sheep for them. And then they would come and collect it. The, the gentry or even the nobility would do this. Now they're moving to a factory system. The Industrial Revolution is starting to slowly take place and, it, and a textile industry is coming on. And these gentry men want to start businesses right there on their land and they don't want peasants living there. The nobility counter this by passing a series of laws known as laws of primogeniture. This is a law that states that when your father dies and he's a wealthy man, he can only pass on his inheritance to the oldest son and the oldest son only. This made sure that the gentry class didn't continue to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. For instance, if you have a man who's very wealthy and he has five sons, then he divides up his wealth amongst the five sons. Now you have five new members of the gentry class. With the laws of primogeniture, you go from the father, he dies, the oldest son becomes basically his replacement, thereby keeping the gentry class a little bit more controlled and not growing too powerful. This also becomes very important to England because what about those other sons? What are they going to do? They're not going to want to just sit there and, and now have nothing. So eventually these individuals will start to say, well, let's pool our money together and let us start thinking about exploration. They form the world's first joint stock companies. Joe gives $10, Bill gives $25, Harry gives $70, Peter gives $100. They start collecting all their money together in a joint stock. Uh, one of the first big companies in England is called the Virginia Company of London. Virginia named for Queen Elizabeth. I wonder if you can think of why it's called Virginia and Queen Elizabeth. Some of us probably know she was known as the Virgin Queen. She, she never married, so she claimed to be a virgin her entire life. Um, that's why it's called Virginia. This company in 1606 will, will, will be able to pull its money together and help to back the exploration of the, the, the the area known as Virginia and established the first permanent colony in the Americas by the English known, known as Jamestown. 
And that is going to be the end of this lecture, and we will start off with Jamestown in lecture number three. So I thank you for all your time, for listening, and again, hope to see you guys real soon now. Oh, in just less than a week.